Good morning. I'm Martin Eden, the political editor of Cameo Radio, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and thank you very much for coming to this press conference. And I begin with the usual uh, note and ask you to turn off any of our phones. This event is being recorded and we don't want the embarrassment of a phone going off. I was in seconded by Premier to go to Egypt in the summer to work with the churches there to help them work out how best to play their part in the Egyptian revolution and to handle issues of the media. And when I heard the military describing the Christians as the enemy of the revolution, I was totally, utterly shocked because the people I met, the people with whom I did that workshop, were quite clearly the very opposite of that and had been openly participating in a peaceful, more abiding way in the demonstrations and revolutionary activity to bring about the fall of President Mubarak and uh, the pursuit of a genuine movement towards the democratic society. I was not impressed with the response of many parts of the British media and the way they handled that massacre two weeks ago. And for that reason, Premier decided, very much in partnership with Christian Solidarity Worldwide, which has a strong track record in working for religious liberty across the world, across all faiths and communities, uh, to try to invite you to this event and to nail the lie that was being propounded by the Egyptian military, that it was the Christians who caused the violence, it was the Christians who were the enemy of the revolution. And we want this morning to present to you the evidence that that is a lie. It's not my purpose to go on, it is to introduce our uh, chairman, Mervyn Thomas, the Chief Executive of Christian Solidarity, and he will take control and introduce the other speakers and steer us through the programme. Mervyn, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Martin has just said, I'm from Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Um, the reason we're here is because we believe um, our mission is to be a voice for voiceless people. And, uh, and we also believe that the Coptic Christian community in, uh, in Egypt um, are increasingly voiceless um, in, uh, in their situation in that country. And we've called this press conference uh, together with Premier Radio uh, to further raise awareness of the continuing marginalization of, uh, of the Coptic Christian community in Egypt. Persecution of Christians by both by the state and by groups of Islamists has been happening over many years in Egypt. In fact, the church was, of course, founded out of persecution. Uh, the founder of the church was Saint Mark, who himself was um, dragged by the neck through the streets of Alexandria um, in a martyr's death. We in CSW decided over a year ago that we wanted to focus during 2012, uh, sorry, uh, during 2011, um, uh, we wanted to focus our supporter campaign for this year on Egypt. And, uh, and, and so we launched our No Way Out campaign at the beginning of the year. We made that decision uh, before there was any hint of a revolution in Egypt. And in fact, our launch date for um, which we launched with a day of prayer in London on January the 29th. That was fixed about this time last year, and we had no idea that two days before that things would begin to kick off. The revolution would start in, in Tahrir Square. Following the toppling of the regime, uh, there were high hopes, I think, that this would usher in a new era of justice. And we must keep those hopes high, even though current events are not looking too good. Uh, and we hoped that religious freedom uh, for all would happen in a, in a democratic Egypt. Like Martin, we too in CSW were involved in some training 
um, just a few weeks ago in, in Egypt of, of Christians wanting uh, Christians in Egypt wanting to play their part as Egyptian citizens um, in the in the formation of the new and just Egypt and uh, and and we found uh, like party did these people are not enemies of the revolution they're not enemies of Egypt they're people who want to play their part as equal citizens sadly uh, nothing has changed uh, since January and attacks on Christians and churches actually have increased in the uh, last nine months just over two weeks ago I was in Egypt in Cairo uh, and meeting with Christian leaders and on the day I left uh, a church building was destroyed in Aswan Coptic Christians had had enough of, of being treated as second-class citizens uh, of, of not having any protection of being actually dismissed um, as irrelevant and, uh, and in fact no investigation even today as we speak uh, nearly a year after the Alexandra bombing has an investigation even started and so on October the 9th they took peacefully to the streets to protest and instead of being protected in that protest they were brutally attacked by those who should have afforded them that protection. We are here today to learn the true facts of Egypt's Bloody Sunday and to call for an independent judicial inquiry into what happened two weeks ago. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce His Grace Bishop Angelos, who is the, uh, is the General uh, Bishop of the Coptic Church in the UK and a, um, a, a strong voice uh, for his people back home in Egypt. Your Grace. Thank you, Mervyn. Um, I want to start by thanking um, Mervyn and CSW and also the team at Premier Media and Peter Carriage for all their work that they've done uh, for this cause and uh, for calling this, this meeting, which uh, I think is very important. Um, before I say anything, um, I would like you to just pay attention to the screen. We have um, um, three short clips that we'd like you to see. And uh, I think that would put everything we're going to say into a little bit of context. On the defensive, Egypt's generals say their men would never intentionally hurt innocent civilians. This was the first time the country's ruling military council explained its actions in such detail. Calling a news conference, they insisted troops were not responsible for the killing of Christian protesters outside state television building on Sunday. <laughs> وعدم إطلاقها لإيران كالاتساق مع عقائدها عقائدها اللي إحنا برغبها The general said had the soldiers been fully armed the ramifications would have been what he called catastrophic Activists hold the military responsible for the killing of some 20 Coptic demonstrators in the Mimi that lasted for hours before a curfew was imposed People specifically angry over military vehicles crushing protesters to death but showing reporters different pictures, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, or SCAF, insisted troops came under attack first. Their vehicles burned, their men, quote, savagely targeted. <laughs> Sunday's violence was the worst in the country since protesters forced Hosni Mubarak out of power in February. Because of questions shaking the country and once again raising the possibility of worsening sectarian divisions. Despite widespread criticism, there are those who support SCAF and will accept the general's narrative. But undoubtedly, critics will be enraged by what appeared to be an attempt to exonerate the army from any blame for Sunday's violence. Families of the victims already planning their own gathering to respond to the military's remarks. Now, 
to Al Jazeera English, um, their station, their uh, bureau manager uh, and chief in Egypt for providing that. That was one view that was given, and um, I think we're going to show you a clip now that really speaks for itself. Last clip would like you to see, which is a short one, um, actually happened a few days before this at another very um, quiet, much quieter demonstration in the same area where uh, the military and military police were dealing with uh, a certain protester in a way that uh, I'm sure you wouldn't expect. I think you'll see from the footage there that we almost need not speak. The, the savagery that has been used is unprecedented. We have seen 
hundreds of demonstrations, protests, marches since January. And not a single one has been dealt with with this level of brutality. One thing that astounds me is even the siege, the raid on the Israeli embassy, which is an attack on sovereign soil and could have been perceived as an act of war, plunging the country into a war the neighboring state, still didn't see the army dealing with this level of intensity. So the question is asked now, why? Why now? Why would these people? Could this have been done with anyone else? There have been numerous Islamic demonstrations, Salafi demonstrations, human rights demonstrations, revolutionary demonstrations. Not a single one has been dealt with in this way. There's a statement that I have prepared that most of you would have already received. If you haven't, please uh, tell uh, one of the uh, organizers here, and we have printed copies for you. But I just want to draw attention to a few points out of that. That as this year commenced and as the revolution came, we saw euphoric scenes of hope that it was going to be a new Egypt. We saw Christians and Muslims side by side celebrating their nationality, their Egyptian presence rather than their religion, which has been the first time for, for years. But then it was only a few weeks later where this idealistic dream faded. And suddenly we saw a spate of attacks in the past 10 months that we haven't seen in the past decades. There have been churches burnt down, churches demolished. And that was in the full view of the military that didn't step in. That military that said it would not fire a single shot on an Egyptian citizen. That military that said it could not step in because it wasn't mandated. Suddenly this time decided to step in. I want to read one paragraph to you. Once the march entered into Maspero, after being a peaceful march for almost 10 kilometers, there was a sudden escalation within moments and the army used excessive lethal force against peaceful violent demonstrators. The army that said in January it would not fire a single shot against the Egyptian citizen and then stood by and watched churches burnt and Egyptian Christians killed, now used light ammunition and excessive force, firing lethal shots and driving armored personnel carriers directly into crowds, mowing people down and killing many. We saw that transgression by the military. But then we saw the media inciting civil unrest by telling people to go out and protect their army from the Christians who were attacking it. And yet these people have not been brought to any sort of justice, have not been asked. Where although there is a very clear rule in Egypt against religious and sectarian hatred. The army then, to add insult to injury, came out a few days later and had that disturbing press conference where apparently not a single shot had been fired by an army that was there to protect a very important building so they could not have been unarmed. And we were told that armored personnel carriers were not driven into people but were fleeing from people because they were chased by demonstrators. I don't think they're the sort of scenes we saw. Then we've been given various, various perspectives that armored personnel carriers were stolen and therefore people were driving them into people. I didn't realize that they could be so easily driven, so why are we spending so much money on the military? And how is it that a military can actually stand by and see a multi-million dollar piece of equipment being stolen in the presence of 600 soldiers? It gives us a little bit to worry about on our borders. There is so much to think about here. But as a church leader, I also want to make a very clear point. And again, this is in a statement. 
This is indeed a turning point in Egypt's contemporary history, a time in which there can be a positive reform and the building of a new Egypt that is cohesive and instills a sense of citizenship, ownership, and responsibility into every Egyptian. Ceasing to focus on a person's religion and more on his or her contribution and accountability to a single nation state. Alternatively, this can be a point at which we merely continue to deny the reality and presence of conflict, leave unlawful acts, uh, unlawful acts unresolved and unprosecuted, present one part of the community as a justifiable and attainable target, and continue to place this wedge between members of one nation. As I also said, that persecution is nothing new to Christianity or to Christians. We do not fear for Christians in Christianity in Egypt because we are confident in God and his presence with them. We have not waged a holy war. We do not attack in the name of God. We are not defiant in an aggressive way. <clears throat> but we know that Egypt has been, is, and will continue to be a place in which Christians witness their faith on a day-to-day -day basis. We do have a fear for Egypt because it is Egypt that will weaken if Egyptians do not stand together and this unhealthy separation and discrimination continues. There is um, one of the stories that will bring this into perspective and um, Angela will read that to you. Okay, this testimony is um, by a young girl called Vivian Magdi. This is her speaking and she actually did an interview on national TV. I don't know what happened. Last Thursday, Michael, he's not used to going into protests or anything. But on Thursday, he called me and he was really upset. Vivian, I have to go. I said, OK, fine. We'll go and stand there, but we won't do anything. So he said, OK. He said, don't leave me today. So I got scared for him and I went with him. We were walking and there was no problem until we got to Shobra. And then we found people stopping us and telling him, take her and go away, take her and go away. And I said, no, don't send me away, I will stand next to you. He said, okay, fine, hold my hand and don't leave me. I said, okay. In my hand, I had a bag which was full of papers. He took it and put it over my head and said, pass. And he made me pass. And there was nothing. We came to go into Maspiro and there was nothing. People had stopped. There had been some problems, but normal problems far away. We were walking and every time he saw a shop, he would run and get water. He was buying phone credit for people. He was telling people, whoever wants water, I'll get it for you. He bought bottles of water and put them in my bag and said, whoever gets thirsty, give them water. I asked him why. We went out doing the revolution and you didn't do this. He said, today I have money, let the people be happy. So we kept walking amongst the people. As soon as we got into the street at the Corniche, there were lots of people in front of us. We couldn't see how far, but we heard shots. Coming from pistols or guns, I couldn't tell the difference, and people were running. They were telling him, take her and run, get women out of here and get girls away from here. I said to him, no, I'm with you. We, we said we were not gonna do anything. Let's leave, let's go, Michael. He said, no, let's wait and see what's gonna happen. Are we going to leave them? Look, the people have fallen. I said, Michael, come on. He said, no, we'll stand with them. He held my hand and we found a tank moving. They were shooting from the tank. He pulled me out of the way and I said to him, please, can we leave now? He said, okay, let's go, I'm worried about you. He took me to one side. We were on the pavement and we found that the tank that had gone all the way opposite Maspiro was coming back and doing a zigzag in the street. So he held my hand and said, don't leave me, stay with me, don't be scared. It was coming up onto the pavement and down off the pavement. I was terrified, I couldn't do anything. And then suddenly he held my hand. I got pushed, I don't know where I went. I looked behind me and I didn't find him. I saw that the tank had taken him with it. It took him in the wheels. His legs were destroyed, he got thrown on the pavement which cracked his skull. I didn't understand. All I thought was that he had a problem with his legs, so I thought he fainted. 
Then I found that the soldiers surrounded us and they started hitting him, and he didn't say a word. I even told them, I'll kiss your feet, leave him alone, get away from him, he doesn't even have breath. The people came running around him and I found his neck coming and going with the people. So I took him in my arms and told him, Michael, wake up. And he wasn't talking to me, but he was still breathing and he was holding my hand. <clears throat> and then I pulled him away. One of the soldiers wearing a red hat came and shouted at me and swore at me and hit me. And I found that he was hitting him. And I told him he has no breath. And I threw my body over him. He hit me on my back with sticks that were with him. I was telling them, an ambulance, someone call an ambulance. He said, you, and he swore at me a word that I can't say. I told him, he's going to die, do something. He responded, <clears throat> aren't you the ones that came here? See how you're going to move him now. Anyway, then came the soldiers. They were all around me. They were hitting me and Michael. Another soldier stopped them and said, stop, he's dead. He said, she's going to take him now. So we found four boys walking past to come and take him. I kept telling him, stay with me. He stopped breathing. Blood started coming out of his mouth. He stopped breathing. I didn't understand. The last thing I saw was the blood coming out of his mouth. So we got to the hospital and there were so many cases. They wouldn't let me leave the engagement ring on his hand, so I took it off him. He didn't leave me with anything, except that everything with him was nice. Sunday in Cairo. Before we open up for questions this morning, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce on my left uh, Dr. Helmi Gerges. And uh, Helmi is the founder and leader of the UK Copts Association. And he's here, uh, he founded the organisation in 1999 and they raise awareness of the issues facing Christians in Egypt. They raised them here in the UK Parliament, at the EU, and also in Washington, DC. Um, Helmi is also speaking on behalf of two other activist organizations in this country <coughs> who are unable to be with us today. That is the um, United Cops of Great Britain and also UEFA, United Action for Egyptian Christians. Helmi. Thanks, Mary. <coughs> The Copts are the indigenous Christians of Egypt. They amount to 12 to 15 percent of the population. That's about 10 to 12 million. Sunday, October the 9th, saw the massacre by the Egyptian military forces against the peaceful demonstration by the Coptic community and the occasional Muslim supporters in front of the state TV headquarters at Maspiro to protest the recent burning of a church in Aswan, southern Egypt. <coughs> the un this unjustified aggression left 27 dead and over 300 persons wounded. Military security forces and soldiers initiated this barbaric and inhuman attack on peaceful demonstrators. Let me just use eyewitnesses from the scene. Dr. Imad Gat a senior political analyst at the Al Ahram Center in Cairo, that's for strategic studies, and an eyewitness of the event said on El Nile government TV station that the peaceful demonstrations were attacked by unprovoked military in such a way that amounts to war crime and crime against humanity, putting the responsibility squarely on Marshal Tantawi's shoulders. Dr. Mohammed Munir Mugahe, <coughs> a well respected activist and participant in the demonstration, attested that it was similar to previous demonstrations, very peaceful, with no sign that demonstrators had the <coughs> means or intention to use violence. <coughs> Nawara Nigm, another Muslim activist and the first hand witness confirmed that the demonstration, which included many women, was peaceful, and that security forces shot live ammunition on unarmed people. She saw a soldier beating a young man 
after seeing that his arm was tattooed with a cross. The Alliance of Revolutionary Youth accused the Supreme Council of Armed Forces and the government of utter failure in handling the situation and the state-run TV of inciting sedition between the country's communities. The international community through the United Nations should lead an independent international investigation in the attack, similar to what the United Nations ordered after an Israeli attack in Gaza. Let me just add here very quickly that this had been debated in the United States Congress, in the Canadian uh, House of Commons, in the Australian Parliament. Uh, I think it's about time for our Parliament to do something about this give credit to Baroness Berridge. I think she put a question about three days ago in the House of Lords. But I don't believe we have done enough here, neither did the British media uh, talking enough about the persecution of the Christians in <coughs> Egypt and the Middle East in general. Thank you. Thank you, Helby. Before I just open it up for questions, I, I will just say something from my own personal observation about Egyptian Christians. And I've been working in this kind of work for 30 years. And I've met many Christians from many countries. Somebody actually said to me last week, and in fact it was a Christian journalist, asked me, surely, surely the Christians were, uh, some of the Christians, um, at Miss Pharaoh, were inciting violence. Some of them, surely they must have been, was trying to get me... And you know, I said I, I was not there, I hadn't seen any of these pictures before, but my experience of Egyptian Christians is that they are a peaceful people. And uh, when I was in Cairo two weeks ago, together with Bishop Angelos, I had the pleasure and the privilege of meeting with Pope Shenouda, who made it very clear from the very top of the Orthodox Church in Egypt that, uh, that they, he didn't expect his people to be crying out for justice. I told him quite clearly that we would cry out for justice for him if he didn't want to. Uh, but, but, but the whole ethos of Christians in, inside Egypt is one of peace. Even when we went to Alexandria, our party went to Alexandria, met with the people who had pictures of body parts hanging from the trees outside of the church and were so distressed that, uh, that, that nobody had even been to investigate that bombing. All that they talked about and all that they said, their whole demeanour was one of peace and was not one of making up stories or, or, or trying to make things sound worse than they are. So I would just say, uh, if that's in the back of your mind, um, I'm pretty certain, as certain as you can be, uh, that those people, those Christians, out demonstrating that, that night were there on a peaceful demonstration, as even though they were in great anguish because nobody was taking up their case, nobody was taking up their cause. And, uh, and I hope that those deaths will not have been in vain. And we need to... Uh, raise awareness of this shameful night in Cairo on October the 9th. Let's have any questions, please. Uh, Ed Thornton from the Church Times newspaper. Um, I just wanted if you um, could respond to the Archbishop of Canterbury's statement about the situation in Egypt this week. Um, was it a strong enough response? Would you like to hear more from church leaders in the UK? Um, I'm very thankful to His Grace the Archbishop. I was actually in communication with Lambeth Palace and uh, with uh, his advisers, and um, I, I knew of the statement before it was released. Um, I think it was a measured statement. Um, I am sure that there is more behind it, that we all know also the difficult position of the Archbishop and that. Um, he doesn't want anything that he says to instigate any sort of religious tension. Um, so I'm appreciative of his position, but I also know his heart on this, and I know uh, his direction. I'm also appreciative of 
the question that he actually asked in the House of Lords during the uh, question placed by Baroness Berridge as well. That question was on Tuesday, wasn't it? Yes. If you want to check it in Hansard, and uh, his grace is correct, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury participated in that short debate. If anyone wants the Hansard record and the video footage, then please let us know we have them. <coughs> well, uh, Paul Hobson, uh, Baptist Times. Uh, I was just wondering if you could outline um, exactly <coughs> what your hopes are for the judicial inquiry, for the calling for the judicial inquiry, and what the potential impact of calling for it will be. I think we, we all realise that there must be some sort of inquiry. Um, and of course it needs to be a transparent inquiry that addresses the issues. My concern is from the primary knee-jerk reaction of the military that this is really not being taken very seriously. Um, I can't imagine that we are talking about people starting a riot, even if that was the case, although in all the footage you've seen, in all the footage I've seen even on Egyptian state television, there is not a single image of a demonstrator holding a weapon. I'm sure if there were a handful even, that they would have shown up somewhere. There isn't a single clip of anyone holding a weapon. But even if they were, I think the disproportionate use of power is not something that anyone can legitimize or justify. And the mere fact that there was a justification um, in, in some aspects that uh, armored personnel who were driving these, these <coughs> vehicles were scared. These people are trained for military situations. I don't think some people throwing rocks are going to scare them. So if that is the attitude of the military in the investigation, I'm not quite sure how credible it would be. So that's why we're looking at a judicial inquiry, an independent judicial inquiry, um, to be able to look at this. Um, I know some people have called for international inquiries. That would not be our position as a church, but um, I think Henry may be able to shed some light on that. Well, I, I think I personally believe this is going to be the only way out. I think the, the Canadian uh, Parliament, I, um, I, I must admit, I salute them from here. I think two days ago, the part, a motion unanimously from all parties demanding an independent, uh, transparent uh, inquiry by the United Nations into the affair. Uh, but relying on things to happen, as uh, His Grace just mentioned in Egypt, uh, history, recent history in Egypt, tells us don't expect much. We have in our memory only 10 months ago the uh, massacre on the New Year's uh, mass, 1st of January this year, where 21 innocent Christian lives were lost, and so far the matter hasn't been even referred to courts. So let alone when the culprits here are the military <coughs> people, I don't think or they haven't even dared to uh, remove the governor of Aswan, who, who gave his uh, orders to demolish the church. He's still in his position, Aswan, as he is. So how is he going to punish some of the generals for doing that horrible massacre? No way. Certainly. May I also add something? Um, I do note that there are some um, um, representatives of Egyptian media here, and we have been misquoted in the past, and we have very little faith that things are being quoted faithfully at the moment. So I am repeating categorically that it is not the position of the church that we are calling for an international inquiry, and we will take very strong steps against anyone who says that, because we are not going to be termed as traitors again in our own country. Thank you, Grace. Can I just add from CSW's uh, viewpoint, Neither are we at this stage calling for an international inquiry. Um, and that is simply, and I, I, I clearly said at this stage, um, I think 
one of the messages that that I got on my trip to Cairo, and, and one of my meetings was with um, the Grand Imam of all Egypt, um, El Tayeb uh, Al Hazar, um, came very clearly that um, they didn't want uh, they didn't want a Western style democracy. They didn't want interference from outside in the rebuilding of their country. And we respect that. However, when it comes to issues such as this, um, they need to know that the rest of the world is watching. They need to know that the rest of the world is looking to see how they will respond to this incident. It's not been too clever a response, to put it mildly, so far. But we want to give them the opportunity for an independent judicial inquiry. The answer to the question was, I think was sort of, or the, the question was, how much hope have we got that this would be a useful inquiry? Well, if it does happen, and if it is independent judicial, I believe that is hopeful. But if it doesn't happen, uh, then we may well have to reconsider and look at calls for uh, this to be investigated internationally. That's CSW's uh, stand on the situation at the moment. Hi, Varun Steve from The Guardian. I just wanted to ask whether you have made any representations to the UK Foreign Office, uh, whether you've had any contact with them regarding the issue. Yes, um, we have had contacts. Um, they treat this very seriously. Um, and uh, and they, they themselves uh, are very cagey in their response that they are looking into these events further. Lord Howell um, responded on behalf of the, the government um, in Baroness Berridge's uh, question on, on Tuesday, uh, but they are very aware of what is happening and, uh, and they have made, I know, private, I believe private representations um, to the Egyptian government on this. Um, I, we have been approached as a church by the Foreign Commonwealth Office and by the Minister, um, Alistair Butler, uh, responsible for Middle East and North Africa. And I know the Minister is concerned, so is the Foreign Secretary and also Downing Street. Now it puts us in a very difficult position as a church, because when we're asked very simple questions like, do you think that this was dealt with properly by the army? Um, we're placed in a very difficult position because if we say, yes, it's absolutely fine and sweep it under the carpets, I think we are letting a lot of people down. And we are seen to be lying and we are seen to be uh, coerced by the government because people understand that that is not the truth. And so it reflects badly on the government. And if we say, uh, no, things aren't okay, we're dealt with as traitors, who are reverting to foreign governments to interfere in the sovereign state of Egypt. So for us, it's really a lose-lose situation. So what we want is, to, is the Egyptian government to get its act in order and to actually deal with situations properly. So when we ask questions, we can be proud and transparent of our answers. steps already. Um, I was in D.C. personally on July the 8th. We had a, a conference in the American Congress and we had eight congressmen at the time um, talking to us. That's before the massacre. And um, they actually introduced a, a bill for Egypt that uh, Mr. Obama is putting um, a representative in the Middle East to look after uh, religious minorities in the area. I was told that um, a congressman of North, um, uh, New Jersey North, uh, is already 
uh, putting a motion in the Congress asking for international intervention through the United Nations. And when we ask for that, I don't think we're breaking any laws. Uh, this is international law applied. If uh, any human beings have their human rights uh, abused in such a way and their governments do nothing, uh, their cry has to be taken by the international community. Nobody should blame the Christian. We, as Christians, you shouldn't be ashamed by doing that. If we are not getting our rights through our government, we are entitled to ask anybody on earth legally through the United Nations to do that. The Lebanese did it in the days of Rafiq Hariri. Uh, the uh, uh, Israelis look in the attack on Gaza, it was referred to the United Nations. We are not asking for uh, uh, a legal way to do it. It's absolutely legal according to uh, international laws. Questions? Sonia Hume, Sat7. Um, I was just wondering uh, what role you feel Christian media in the region like Sat7 has to play at a time like this? Um, firstly, I'd like to commend the role of Christian media in the Middle East um, and a lot of satellite channels as well because they are providing transparency that unfortunately is not there with the national terrestrial channels and I think with the new forms of media whether it be the satellite media or the social networking media we suddenly cannot have a media blackout anymore that feeds people um, things other than the reality so I, I think the place of, of Christian media and Christian satellite channels in the Middle East is to remain transparent, but also we would ask them to remain balanced, as I, I know your network is. Um, we don't want things to be said that are inflammatory, because we consider this to be unchristian. It is not a Christian way to inflame hearts and to inflame communities. Christianity is about love, it's about peace, it's about cohesion, it's about acceptance, and we're very happy to live in Egypt as Christians with Egyptian Muslims as well. We have no problem with that. So I think transparency and a fairness, which we have seen through many of those channels, uh, is very important. But I, 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 and I would add to that, but not shy away from telling the truth. Um, and I think the truth must be told. Uh, as, as His Grace has said, um, in fairness, we in CSW have always been pri prided ourselves in our reports of being objective and, and fair, but the truth must be told, and I fear at the moment the truth isn't being told. And so I would encourage all media, not just Christian media in the region, uh, that these the facts need to be shown. This was a massacre. This was a deliberate killing. Of, of Christians who, my guess is that that would not have been, and this is a personal guess, that that would not have happened against um, any other type of demonstration, but it proves um, the, the fact that Egyptians are treated as second class citizens um, in Egypt, and that's what we must see changed in the new Egypt. Might add something about them? Yeah. Um, Mervyn's saying it's intentional, and I think many people agree with him, but um, even if we take the line that it was unintentional, we all know that at law there's a difference between murder and manslaughter. And we all know that we are driving our personal cars down the street and we hit people, and this person is injured or dies, we are still prosecuted for that. We also know that within the military there's a very clear chain of command. Any action, whether it is along the chain of command, or breaking the chain of command, is able to be sought and traced. And so within that spirit, I think there must be that honesty and transparency that we've seen in these images that have all been through satellite television. It, well, they went through terrestrial channels. And um, so I think that distinction should be made as well. There must be prosecution somehow whether these soldiers were rogue soldiers, 
and so they acted out of command, where they received the command from somewhere in the line, and it was a rogue officer. Wherever it came from, or if they acted without a command coming, it is traceable and must be dealt with accordingly. Okay. No questions? I think if we continue the way we're continuing, it is extremely grim. But I don't think we need to continue the way we're continuing. I think Egypt can have a very good future, and we hope it has a very good future. Because the people are good people. All Christian, all, all, all Egyptians, Christian or Muslim, are by nature good people. Of course there are certain elements, but by and large, I think Egypt can have a very good future, and we're hopeful for it. Um, but it needs matters to be dealt with. You can't have decades of religious separation and a lack of agenda of s forming any sort of social cohesion and equality and expect that just to roll along pleasantly. So I hope it's a good future, <coughs> and this is the time to do it. This particular time we're in, with the establishment of a new democracy, a new parliament, a new president, a new mindset, I think is an ideal opportunity. If people in power are going to take this opportunity, then we have a very, very good future because Egypt has wonderful people, wonderful resources, and a wonderful heritage. But I think if things are left, left as they are, and if they are dealt with as we have seen them in the past week, then it's not going to achieve that. I would actually expect uh, things to be much better if um, a new constitution is written and um, is written properly, letting, giving a chance to all parties to contribute it. If we have more laws to um, stop discrimination against minorities, people are uh, treated equally. If we put new laws for hate speech against the Christians, if we stop all ways of discrimination through applicable laws which acted upon, which just put on paper, then there can be a great future for Egypt and the Egyptians. Thank you. I, I'd like to add too, um, <coughs> I still believe there's hope for, for Egypt. Um, for many years, Christians and Muslims have in general lived peacefully side by side. We saw in um, we saw during the revolution. In fact, I remember very clearly during the day of prayer we had on January the 29th of receiving a tweet that that came from Tahrir Square uh, that said uh, a section of the crowd, an Islamist section of the crowd, were chanting Al Akbar, and that the rest of the crowd drowned out that chant uh, with a clear chant of. Um, Muslims and Christians, we are all Egyptians. And I think when you look at the makeup of Egypt, and, and you know, can I just say, uh, having spoken to many people in Cairo a few weeks ago, you've got uh, as many different opinions of what will happen in the future as people you speak to, and those opinions are likely to change the next day uh, because things are so volatile. But I think. I think there is hope because 10% of the country are Christian and you've got a further 60% who are Sufi Muslims, liberal, moderate Muslims, who I don't think want, I know, don't want the Islamist agenda, do not want a theocracy, who want religious freedom for all. We have many cases of Muslims surrounding and protecting Christians going into church during the last few months and in Tahrir Square. We have many um, instances of, the, of that happening the other way too, of Christians protecting Muslims. If that spirit can be engendered, if that spirit can be taken up um, throughout Egypt, there is hope for Egypt. But there will only be hope 
when everybody is treated equally. And the key, I believe, to a peaceful and prosperous um, future for Egypt is religious freedom for all. And when that happens, I believe we have got hope. And I certainly sit here today with hope. The reason we've called this press conference is because we need to raise these issues so that there can be, so that everything is not, as His Grace has said, swept under the carpet, but is, is brought into the light that justice might be had by all. Any more questions? We've probably got time for one or two more if, possible, if necessary. Thank you. My question, don't you think the religious institution need to look at, to look at on both sides, Christian and Muslim, in order uh, to meet uh, the revolution demand that New Egypt? To look at what? In, uh, in an institution as well. It means we have to find a change in the institution itself. In the church and in Azhar as well. From the church, I don't think we need to change at all because our view has always been very nationalistic. In actual fact, for years we have called for a unified and nationalistic spirit in Egypt. So I, we've never we've never asked for uh, a Christian law within Egypt that discriminates against Muslims. We've never asked or had um, Christian um, supremacy in any sort of job description or. So as a church, the church maintains its, its ecclesial role and doesn't get into <coughs> the political agenda of the country. What we do do, however, is we answer questions. So if we are approached by people and we're supposed to represent our people, then we have a clear responsibility to do so. But uh, I'm open to any suggestions as to how the church can change. Um, I don't see any change necessary. Because, again, we believe that Egypt will only ever be truly successful and reach its optimum potential if it is a country where everyone's freedom and everyone's rights are observed and respected. Um, I can't speak on behalf of, of Al-Azhar, but as a church, I think that would be happening. Thank you. Thank you. I think that will conclude the press conference. I would just say... I think, and particularly, <coughs> I would like to thank both Helmy and His Grace for coming today and for being part of this. And I think you will have seen by the responses from Bishop Angelos that this is not a church out for a fight. This is a church that wants <coughs> to play its role as peaceful, peaceful Egyptian citizens in a new Egypt. We've not heard any fighting talk. We've not heard any strident tone. We've heard measured tones and we've heard peaceful responses. We hope and pray uh, that the future for Egypt will indeed be a peaceful but just future. Thank you all for coming. Can I just, uh, one final point, please, to, to all the media, and especially the, the various representatives of Christian media here. I'm, all, I'm very appreciative to everyone who's been very supportive over the past months and for their prayers. We've received many, many messages from all of our sister churches across the UK, assuring us of, of their prayers and assuring us of their support. And uh, as we have from very many secular groups and many other religious groups as well, I was just invited yesterday by a Hindu group to come, go to their Diwali celebration. They actually broke their program to ask me to speak um, in an act of, of, of fellowship. So we're very thankful to the British community generally, to all, its, uh, to all of its people, and especially to our churches, our sister churches, who have been so supportive, and the Christian media that has also been uh, quite supportive in getting the truth out. We don't want bias, but we're very appreciative that there are portals for the truth. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.